Well, good afternoon. I'll invite you to take your seats for our final session of this symposium. First of all, thank you for joining us and for participating uh, these last two days. We're grateful for those of you who have been able to join us in person and for the uh, larger number of you who have joined us virtually over the last few days. Uh, we also recognize uh, with us uh, President Oaks of, of the First Presidency and grateful for his interest. It's my pleasure to introduce our final keynote speaker, Elder Garrett W. Gong. Following Elder Gong's remarks, uh, Elise Reynolds, an archivist in the Church History Department, will give our closing prayer. Throughout his life, Elder Gong has had many opportunities to Consider the importance of religious liberty on the global stage. He holds a doctorate in international relations from Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar. After that, he served as, as a special assistant to the Under Secretary of State in the U.S. State Department, as a special assistant to the U.S. Ambassador in Beijing. He then served in positions at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., and then as a, an assistant to the President for planning and assessment at BYU. His global responsibilities uh, continued after his calling as a general authority. He has served as uh, in the area presidency in our Asia area uh, as a member of the presidency of the 70 and then for the last few years as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. One of his current assignments, uh, speaking of historical perspectives, is to serve as an advisor to the church history department. We're grateful for his wise counsel and uh, leadership. Elder Gong. Thank you, Matt. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, friends, with appreciation, we acknowledge the faith, dedication, and experience of those who co-sponsor and participate in this church history symposium. We warmly welcome President Dallin H. Oaks. I think Sister Kristen Oaks is here, and I think Sister Gong may be here too. President Oaks is, of course, both a practitioner of church history and a champion of religious liberty. We also acknowledge and warmly welcome leaders and associates from BYU Religious Education, BYU Department of Church History and Doctrine, and of course, our church history department and each of you who are here today. Our previous panel's discussion on anxiously engaged in a good cause provides a natural lead-in for this concluding session on religious liberty in historical and global perspective. Even to the casual observer, leaders and members of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are deeply committed to religious liberty, as we've been discussing. Indeed, for Latter-day Saints, the protection and promotion of religious liberty for all is not a casual matter. At the same time, Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty may appear to some to be current, American, and political. Current as in primarily a contemporary concern, American as in largely an issue in the United States, and political as in specifically intended to balance legal and political religious freedom and non-discrimination to provide fairness for all. This audience, of course, has taken a more nuanced look, but broadly, people may think that church commitment to religious liberty is focused on current American and political elements. And of course, by necessity, church commitment does include current American and political elements. But a purpose of my comments today is to place church championing of religious liberty in a broader historical and global perspective. That's my assignment in this topic. By necessity, I can only suggest in broad schematic fashion how deeply rooted religious liberty is in the core and longstanding doctrinal, historical, and global belief and experience of the Latter-day Saints, something we've already begun to touch on. First, doctrine. Moral agency, which requires religious liberty for its full effective expression, 
is a core doctrine in Restoration Scripture, including in the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants. We believe we, as God's children, can realize our divine identity and potential most fully only as we are able to choose freely between good and evil, right and wrong, and to experience the consequences of and accountability for our choices. Second, historical experience. Religious liberty, of course, is integral to the lived Latter-day Saint historical experience, including as articulated and championed from our earliest days by the prophet Joseph Smith and through our history by other church leaders. Those not of our faith are sometimes surprised that the Latter-day Saints, who have suffered as much religious bigotry and religious persecution as we have, have from the beginning of the Restoration championed religious liberty for all. Third, global experience. Religious liberty is a natural global need as Latter-day Saint members seek to honor, obey, and sustain the law and contribute to our societies and communities in nations, kindreds, tongues, and peoples across the world. Therefore, in today's presentation, uh, I will touch on each of those three themes. I'll also invite five friends to share vignettes of religious liberty in historical and global Latter-day Saint perspective. By video, we'll hear from Alexander Dushku, Matt Grow, Kate Holbrook, Bill Atkin, and Robert Smith. You will enjoy and benefit from the passion and expertise of these individuals as I have. Let us then consider in turn the three themes of religious liberty, first in Latter-day Saint doctrine, second in church history, and in global church experience. Remembering this is an overall schematic. Let's begin with religious liberty and restoration scripture. Imagine the young prophet Joseph Smith in the early days of the restoration as he translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God and received the revelations which became the Doctrine and Covenants. Imagine Moroni instructing and mentoring the young Joseph not only on the doctrines of heaven but on the necessary lessons of the Book of Mormon prophets who foresaw our day and knew our needs. Moroni, after all, had lived directly and vicariously through the rise and fall of civilizations where religious liberty was a central issue, to use the phrase, at all times and in all places, even unto death for his people. Moroni poignantly declared that because he would not deny his testimony of the Christ, he, Moroni, wandered whithersoever he could for the safety of his own life. In some ways, history was to repeat itself. The prophet Joseph and our people would experience similar poignant demands for faith and sacrifice, perhaps prepared and fortified by what the young prophet Joseph was learning from Moroni and the Book of Mormon about the need for religious liberty. To illustrate the life and death reality of religious liberty in Moroni's experience and in the Book of Mormon, let us review Book of Mormon passages that describe religious liberty in three somber words. Put to death. In the Book of Mormon, prophets including Abinadi are put to death in cruel fashion for testifying of religious truth. Mosiah chapter 17, verse 1. When Abinadi had finished these sayings, the king commanded that the priest should take him and cause that he should be put to death. At various times in the Book of Mormon, those believing in Jesus Christ or found calling upon God were put to death. Fierce wars were fought over religious belief. 
Mosiah chapter 24, verse 11. And Amulon commanded them that they should stop their cries. And he put guards over them to watch them, that whosoever should be found calling upon God should be put to death. Here I pause briefly. Near Hans Mill last week, where I was on assignment, I recalled a passage I'd recently read in Saints, Volume 1, about conditions at Hans Mill in winter 1838. Quote, the women in the settlement held prayer meetings, asking the Lord to heal their wounded. When mob members learned about these prayer meetings, they threatened to wipe out the settlement if the women continued praying. Close quote. Back to the Book of Mormon. Alma chapter 25, verse 7. And it came to pass that those rulers who were the remnant of the children of Amulon caused that they should be put to death. Yea, all those that believed in these things. Third Nephi 1, verse 9. There was a day set apart by the unbelievers that all those who believed in those traditions should be put to death, except the sign should come to pass, which had been given by Samuel the prophet. Ether chapter 11, verse 5. These are, of course, familiar verses to us, but I was struck as I read them together. The brother of Shiblon caused that all the prophets who prophesied of the destruction of the people should be put to death. Moroni chapter 1, verse 2, 3. Behold, their wars were exceedingly fierce among themselves, and because of their hatred, they put to death every Nephite that will not deny the Christ. And I, Moroni, will not deny the Christ. Wherefore, I wander whithersoever I can for the safety of mine own life. As mentioned earlier, Moroni and the prophet Joseph may have come to share a special experiential bond and fierce love for religious liberty. As in 3 Nephi, executions of those who held religious conviction were sometimes carried out extra judicious, judicially. 3 Nephi 6, 23, many, quote, who testified of the things pertaining to Christ, who testified boldly, were taken and put to death secretly by the judges that the knowledge of their death came not into the governor of the land until after their death." Close quote. Religious liberty in the Book of Mormon includes examples of legal parameters in war and peace to protect believers and non-believers. Facing life and death realities, Moroni felt justified in putting Amalekiah to death and imprisoning the men of Pacas, but only according to the legal system with its established procedures for determining law based on the voice of the people, as we read in Alma 46, Alma 62, and Alma 51. Again, these Book of Mormon examples of what is at stake with religious liberty come from the single scriptural reference put to death. From the beginning of Moroni's instruction and the translation of Book of Mormon truths, the prophet Joseph would learn the doctrinal, spiritual, and physical life and death need for religious liberty and the serious consequences when religious liberty is denied. Religious liberty is also a core doctrinal theme in the Doctrine and Covenants, including in sections 98, 101, 109, and section 134, all well known to this group here. In these sections, the Lord declares six principles to the young prophet Joseph. First, the Lord teaches the prophet Joseph and each of us the need to protect and promote the exercise of individual moral agency and its related accountability. Quote, that every man and woman may act in doctrine and principle pertaining to fraternity, according to the moral agency which I have given unto him, that every man and woman may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment. Close quote. Says the Lord, 
I, the Lord, make you free. Therefore, ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Second, the Lord indicates these constitutional principles belong to all mankind. Quote, the principle of freedom in maintaining rights and privileges belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. Third, constitutional principles and laws reflect God's inspiration, but also require that good, wise, and honest men and women be sought for and upheld in order for constitutional principles and practices to be implemented. Fourth, do your business by the voice of the people. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Fifth, it is not right that any man should be in bondage one to another. Finally, six, Doctrine and Covenants section 134 states our belief that governments were instituted of God for the benefit of man, that he holds men accountable for their acts in relation to them, both in making laws and administering them for the good and safety of society. We need not elaborate here. Each element related to religious liberty found in Doctrine and Covenants section 134, including free exercise of conscience, voice of the people, administration of law with equity and justice, not prescribing rules of worship to bind the consciences of men, nor dictating forms for public or private devotion, nor suppressing the freedom of the soul, while holding sacred the freedom of conscience. But we will now hear by video about the right to gather, which is both a doctrinal need and a basic right. Alexander Dushku is an attorney who focuses on religious liberty for the church. Alexander, will you please share your thoughts? The right to gather deals with the communal aspect of religious liberty. Elder Gong has taught about covenantal belonging, and that beautiful phrase has both a vertical component and a horizontal component to it, at least as I've understood it. Um, vertically, it, it relates to being connected with God individually. But horizontally, it also relates to being connected to each other, to being connected to our families and to our, our wards and our stakes. Um, this important aspect of connectedness really relates to the right to gather. Our Savior said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So gathering is a fundamental aspect of the religious experience and of religious liberty. As a practical matter though, um, the right to gather includes some simple but very important things. Um, for example, it includes the right to form a legal entity so that a faith community can, can purchase land and build a chapel, for example, build a meeting house, or at least lease space in which they can gather. Um, but even more fundamentally than that, uh, it, it includes and must include the right of the faith community to define its own doctrine, to define its sacraments, its sacred rites, um, to establish who is worthy to participate in its sacred rites. So it's absolutely vital and critical, and there are many secular interests that are now pressing against that right to gather, that autonomy of religious organizations to determine who and what they are. In conclusion, Elder David A. Bednar said recently, and I thought this was great, he said, sooner or later, if we're not gathering, we're scattering. A strong right to gather lies at the very heart of religious liberty. Thank you, Alexander. It is said lightning does not strike the same place twice. Yet divine inspiration struck twice with twin miracles at Philadelphia, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. For me, Constitution Hall is sacred ground, as is the Pennsylvania Philadelphia Temple. The two, of course, are now less than two miles apart. While principles of religious freedom are found in the Bible, Doctrinal and practical concerns for religious liberty are interwoven in fundamental ways in Restoration Scripture. Contemporary Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty draws on these foundations, but to be clear, this is our theme, 
these theological and doctrinal foundations are long-standing and predate any current political, American, or political concern. This brings us to our second theme, religious liberty in church history. Concern for religious liberty is evident throughout Latter-day Saint history, as this group well knows, from the earliest days of the Restoration to the present. Joseph Smith, of course, was no stranger to issues of religious freedom, whether it was facing personal opposition to his early visions or witnessing intense and widespread persecution of Latter-day Saints. By 1843, the issue was so central to his religious and political thinking that he wrote all the candidates for U.S. president and asked if they would protect Latter-day Saints' rights. When the responses were unsatisfactory, the prophet mounted a pre presidential campaign of his own, centered on religious and civil freedoms. We'll now hear from Matt Groh, Church History Department Managing Director, and then Kate Holbrook, Academic Collaborations Director, Church History Department. Matt, even in private settings, such as with the Council of 50 in the 1840s, the Prophet Joseph spoke with deep conviction about religious liberty. What did he say? A few years ago, the Joseph Smith Papers published the minutes of the Council of 50, an organization that Joseph Smith had created to protect the temporal interests of the church and to prepare for the kingdom of God on earth. Scholars had not previously been given access, and there was a lot of speculation about what the minutes might contain. Along with several others, I helped prepare those minutes for publication. One of the things that I found most interesting was Joseph's statements on religious liberty. In this very confidential council, Joseph felt safe to share his candid views. His statements were not public posturing. Joseph invited three men to join the Council of Fifty who were not church members. He did this to demonstrate how he believed the kingdom of God on earth would work. Religious liberty for women and men was essential. For Joseph, the Latter-day Saint doctrine of individual agency explained the importance of religious liberty. God can save or damn a man only on the principle that every man acts, chooses, and worships for himself. Hence, Joseph said, the importance of thrusting from us every spirit of bigotry and intolerance towards a man's religious sentiments, that spirit which has drenched the earth with blood. For Joseph, the inalienable right of man to think as he pleases and worship as he pleases was the first law of everything that is sacred. Looking around the room at the assembled men, he said, I will appeal to every man in this council, beginning at the youngest, that when he arrives to the years of old age, he will have to say that the principles of intolerance and bigotry never had a place in this kingdom, nor in my breast, and that he is even then read, ready to die rather than yield to such things. Thank you, Matt. Kate, Latter-day Saint women have long been dedicated to religious liberty, including First Amendment guarantees in the 1870s through the 1890s. Would you please tell us about that? The First Amendment guarantees two main principles, the right to religious belief and practice, and the fact that the government will not favor any one religion or non-religion over another. What the amendment assumes but does not elucidate is the necessity that religious and secular groups themselves support these principles as well. It is not enough for the government alone to do so. The fact that Latter-day Saint women have trusted in this amendment, even when government actors did not protect their religious liberty, strikes me as very important. This was a people who believed in the rule of law and could take the long view. Here are two brief examples. First, in 1870, when federal legislation was introduced to diminish the church's economic and political power, Relief Society members gathered in a ladies' mass meeting to discuss solutions. Chair Sarah Kimball, quote, spoke of the part our forefathers had taken in the struggle for freedom, how they had suffered and bled for the principles of civil and religious liberty. 
and she felt that we would be unworthy of the names we bear and of the blood in our veins should we longer remain silent." Close quote. For Kimball, the best way to combat an unfair bill was to participate in the system. At the end of the meeting, attendees proposed two solutions. Number one, women would demand of the territorial governor the right to vote. And number two, two Relief Society representatives would travel to Washington, D.C. Thus, the response to threats against their religious liberty was to sustain the rule of law, this time by demanding the right to participate as voters and by appealing to federal legislators. Second example, a month after that mass meeting, and partly in response to the threat of hostile federal legislation, women in Utah won the right to vote. They exercised that right for 17 years before it was rescinded as another infringement of religious liberty. To regain the vote, women formed the Utah Woman Suffrage Association with local associations throughout Utah Territory. At a convention, physician and acting chaplain Elvira Barney said a prayer, and her words display again that dedication to the rule of law and religious liberty. Quote, Wilt thou be with woman as thou hast with man? And may she serve to smooth the wrinkles of unjust laws as she does and has the pillows beneath the aching heads of thy soldiers and servants." Close quote. Thank you, Kate. Church leaders draw on our early experiences of persecution and our early devotion to religious liberty as we speak with political and religious leaders about the need for and benefits for societies to protect and advance religious liberty today. Indeed, we find inspiration in our history and believe that because of our own experiences, Latter-day Saints have a special duty to speak on behalf of religious liberty for all groups. For example, Elder David A. Bednar and I participated in a Brigham Young, a recent Brigham Young University conference on Muslims and Latter-day Saints understanding one another. We stated the strong interest of the church in religious liberty as a long-standing concern pertaining to ourselves and other religious faiths and groups, in this case, followers of the Islamic faith. In the presentation, we noted Again, things very familiar to this group. People of faith need to stand together for tolerance and dignity of people of all religious beliefs. Our 11th article of faith states, we claim the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience and allow all men, women, the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. The prophet Joseph Smith declared, I am just as ready to die in defending the rights of a Presbyterian, a Baptist, or a good man of any other denomination for the same principle which would trample upon the rights of the Latter-day Saints, would trample upon the rights of the Roman Catholics, or of any other denomination who may be unpopular. Again, as this audience well knows, when Latter-day Saints founded the city of Nauvoo, we sought to protect religious freedom. Remember, this was part of our uh, broadcast on this topic for particularly our, our Muslim and other uh, viewers. And in 1841 Nauvoo City Ordinance, we who had suffered religious persecution sought to guarantee tolerance for all. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Nauvoo that the Catholics, Presbyterians, Methodists, Baptists, Latter-day Saints, Quakers, Episcopals, Universalists, Unitarians, Muslims, and all other religious sects and denominations, what, whatever, shall have free toleration and equal privileges in this city, 1841. By the way, our church history department colleagues have assembled additional statements by church presidents and leaders regarding religious liberty from the beginning of the Restoration to today. These statements may be found in the proceedings of this symposium. This brings us to our third and final theme, the increasingly global Latter-day Saint experience with religious liberty 
as a worldwide faith with faithful members living among every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Founded on long-standing doctrinal, historical, and global concerns for religious liberty, Latter-day Saint concerns for religious liberty are necessarily global in nature. We'll now hear from Bill Atkin, Church Associate General Counsel. Bill will share a practical example of the Church's contribution to global religious freedom involving the Russian Parliament. In uh, December 31st, 1991, the Soviet Union was dissolved, and January 1st was the beginning of the Russian Federation. The Russian Parliament was, was uh, established at that point in time, and one of the very first things that was being done by the Russian Parliamentary Committee on uh, Freedom of Conscience and Belief and Religion was to enact a new piece of legislation that dealt with uh, the operation of foreign churches in Russia. The head of the committee at the time was a Russian Orthodox priest, and as you can imagine, foreign religions were a target uh, for coming into Russia. A church attorney at the time asked me if what we should do to see if we could impact if in a favorable way that Russian parliament uh, bill on religious freedom. I recommended that the church prepare a brief, analyze from a legal point of view the provisions of the, tr of the draft legislation. That recommendation was accepted, so we organized and submitted on behalf of the church an extensive brief which analyzed the law under international treaty laws. Now, ultimately, that bill was not enacted for various reasons. But two years later, um, we had an opportunity. The Russian parliament was dissolved, and they reestablished the Russian uh, Duma. And the Duma had a new committee on religious affairs. And the head of that committee was not a Russian Orthodox priest. President Oaks and President Nunswander in March of 1994 came to Russia and they asked if they could have a protocol meeting with the head of that committee, which they did. At the end of that protocol meeting, there was a bearded gentleman in a business suit at the end of the table, and he identified himself and, as Father Pelosin. He had been the head of the previous committee in the parliament on religious, on, on religious affairs. At that time, he said, I'd like to tell you something about your church and your contribution to our efforts to look at a new legislation on religious affairs and religious freedom. Father Pelosin told us that, in, that other religions had been very upset about the proposed legislation. They protested outside of parliament. They wrote hostile letters to members of the parliamentary committee. He said, but your church took a different tact your church submitted a brief that did the legal analysis of the legislation under international law, and that proved for us to be the most helpful single contribution that we had received with respect to that legislation. We thank Bill for that uh, vignette, and uh, Cole and Elizabeth and many others who are here, we thank you for the things that you did that made possible many of these kinds of incidences. From its humble beginnings in the United States, the church is now established in nations across the world. This process has involved working with national laws that have varying degrees of respect for religious liberty. As a result, we're continuing to learn much about religious liberty on the global stage. We talked earlier about the G20 Interfaith Forum. In the uh, June 9, uh, 2019, G20 Interfaith Forum in Osaka, Japan, uh, we noted that Pew Research states 80% of the world's population indicate a religious affiliation. This is an important element to acknowledge in practical international policy. We tried there in Osaka to use the language of the international diplomatic and development community to frame seven ways religious inputs and values contribute to practical, principle-based policy to lift communities and countries. First, religious communities help inspire and sustain human dignity and essential freedoms, aspirations, and core values attendant to human dignity. Second, religious communities offer important spiritual, philosophical, and moral capacities on which societies and communities can draw 
to achieve sustainable development. Third, religious communities are an important practical source of volunteers, professional resources, motivation, training, and funding for development. Fourth, religious communities have surge capacity to respond to specific immediate needs, such as natural disasters, and also staying capacity to address long-term human concerns. Fifth, religious communities offer unique connections between international and local organizations. Six, religious communities offer important diversity in interfaith experience and capacity. And finally, each religious and philosophical tradition, remember we're using the, the language of the international diplomatic community, offers its own unique experiences to the rich human storehouse of practical, principle-based approaches to sustainable development and invite mutual respect for religious freedom and core moral values. In his November 12, 2021 Remarks on Religious Liberty at the University of Virginia 2021 Joseph Smith Lecture, and particularly in his December 14, 2001 speech at Sapienza University in Rome, Italy, titled Religious Freedom in an International Context, President Dallin H. Oaks champions religious freedom in global perspective. President Oaks notes, first, freedom of religion and belief as an essential condition for a free society, protected as a fundamental international human right including in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and elsewhere. Second, as we heard earlier, freedom of religion and belief are historically, philosophically, institutionally, and empirically foundational for other important rights. To buttress these points, President Oaks points us to speeches on religious liberty given by elders Quentin L. Cook at the Religious Liberty Summit at Notre Dame University, and Elder D. Todd Christofferson at an Argentina Religious Liberty Forum. Further practical society uh, benefits of religious liberty include the promotion of pluralism and peace, respect and unity, the proper separation of church and state, and the generous provision by faith communities of, quote, critical services to society and its most disadvantaged members, end quote. If you haven't carefully studied President Oaks' full messages at the University of Virginia and University of Sapienza, I encourage you to do so. All these examples lend historic and global weight to the reality that church and church member commitment to religious liberty extends well beyond current American or political concerns. It's time to summarize. Robert Smith, BYU Professor of Church History and Doctrine, what are some specific ways church members can support and advance religious liberty in our communities? In my experience, many members of the church are eager to help support religious freedom and moral values, but they're not quite sure what to do. Let me share some things that our prophets and apostles have taught that can help us all be involved in promoting religious freedom. One of those things is to become educated on the issues. Being at this symposium is a great start. In addition, our church website has a multitude of talks and videos and other instructions on what each of us can do to be involved personally in our communities. It really is a wealth of information. In addition, we've been taught that we should engage in the conversations to find solutions. We need to listen to others, but we also need to not be afraid to speak our mind. Every opinion is important, and even opinions that are based in religion are valued and welcomed in the public square. We have to be careful not to overstep our bounds, but we also need to be careful not to be too in intimidated to speak what we really believe. The third thing that we can do is we can lift where we stand. In other words, if we're involved in education, if we're our children in school, we can be involved with school matters. In our work, we can involve, be involved with work. 
or if we're involved in a community and social media, we can be involved in that community. All of us can be involved to help protect religious values and the morals that undergird them. Thank you, Bob, and each of our friends for adding historical and global perspective to our long-standing Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty. Again, while elements of Latter-day Saint concern for religious liberty are necessarily a practical matter, appropriately current American and political, the depth and scope of Latter-day Saint concern for religious liberty is wider, deeper, and more longstanding. When seen in historical and global his perspective, church commitment to religious liberty is rooted in our core religious doctrine, fundamental to God's plan. Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty is manifest in our lived experience, religious practice, and statements of belief and practice from the time of the prophet Joseph to church leaders and presidents today. And Latter-day Saint commitment to religious liberty is a practical reality and need as faithful church members seek to honor, obey, and sustain the law and contribute as good parents and good citizens in our communities and countries across the world. How grateful we are for the ways religious liberty benefits societies, families, and individuals, especially when understood in historical and global perspective we recognize why members and friends of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have and will consistently seek to support, preserve, and advance religious liberty in appropriate times and ways now and for future generations. May the Lord bless us in these efforts, I pray. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful that we have been able to gather for this symposium. We're grateful for all of those who contribute, contributed their time and talents and efforts and expertise to make this possible and for the knowledge and inspiration we have received through their efforts. We are grateful for the religious liberty that we enjoy and that we can exercise our agency in accordance with our knowledge of the gospel, and we are grateful for prophetic guidance that helps us know how to be good citizens and good disciples in exercising that agency. We pray that thou wilt bless us as we depart, that we will act on the information that we have received and the inspiration that we have received and become wise advocates and protectors of religious freedom for all thy children across the world. And we pray for these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.